back with another episode of Reference Points. I'm joined by Eric Wind, longtime Hodinkee contributor, friend of Hodinkee, and the founder of Wind Vintage. Thank you, Tim. Today we're here to talk about the GMT Master by Rolex, one of the most important vintage watches ever made by Rolex, one of its most collectible references, and what has come to be seen as really the ideal traveler's watch. What would you say that the GMT Master means to the vintage watch collecting community? It's one of the most iconic models, period. You think about in television how many people and movies have worn GMT Masters. Marlon Brando from Apocalypse Now. Magnum P.I. had a 16750, which so many people thought looked cool on his wrist. Pablo Picasso had one. Dizzy Gillespie. Really interesting people wore GMT Masters, so people feel really good about having something that's so iconic. And today it's one of the most difficult to obtain watches at retail on the planet. That's right. Today we're gonna to look at the reference 6542, the reference 1675 in gilt dials and matte dials, watches with gold, late GMT Masters and early GMT Master IIs, and then modern GMT Master IIs. But it all started with the reference 6542, which is up here. Can you take us away with that? Pan Am worked with Rolex to make a watch for their pilots in order to track two time zones. That's what we have here in steel. Here are two sort of common and collectible variations. The one on the left has the smaller loom plots, and the one on the right has the big loom plots with a case production in 1958. Both of these show you also the way that these Bakelite bezels, that sort of primitive form of plastic, can age over time. Mm. And I understand these Bakelite bezels on the 6542 are quite rare. They're very rare. There was a famous lawsuit against Rolex in the United States. Uh, a gentleman claimed that his family got cancer from the bezels because they're so radioactive. Rolex did a recall, and during that period, there were 605 precisely uh, imported into the United States, which is an incredibly small number yes. when you think about yes. that period of time. That was across both steel and the gold variations. For gold, there's sort of two common dial types, but they all had this single color bezel, which was interesting, whereas the steel had what we call today the Pepsi bezel. And so many of these Bakelite bezels were replaced with aluminum inserts. Yeah, the right, yeah right around the time they transitioned. So mm -hmm. this is a, a very early conversion watch where it was presumably sent in and converted. And then we get into the 1675. And, and this was a watch that was produced in many, many different variations over more than two decades. We have a whole array here. These are just the gilt glossy dials. You begin with the earliest version, which has what's called an OCC dial, where it just says officially certified chronometer. The dial looks very similar to the 6542 dials, of course. The dial itself is a little bit larger than the 6542 dial, so they're not interchangeable exactly. That is a very short production within the 1675 before they switch to the SCOC text, the superlative chronometer officially certified. I just have two of these, both with the pointed crown guards. They sort of resemble a parrot beak, mm -hmm. um, but one is tropical and one is not tropical. And then we have this watch here. Yeah, then you continue with the chapter ring where you see the full circle around the dial. This one has an exclamation point. That was around the time there was this transition with the loom from radium to tritium, so this is considered to be a mixture of loom. And then we switched to what we call today the open chapter ring, where you don't see a circle around the entire dial. The watch on the left is called the double Swiss underline. There's two Swiss signatures on the bottom of the dial with an underline below the SCOC text. And the watch on the right has a double Swiss as well, but with a Swiss and then a T less than 25. So a little bit more specific about the radioactivity of the tritium. 
continuing with this open chapter dial, gilt dial, you have the last run of gilt 1675s. The one on the left has sort of larger loom plots and uh, these more gold hands. The watch on the right is what you typically see where the hands aren't quite so gold in terms of the metal color and uh, little smaller hour plots. And that brings us to what comes next, the matte dials in the 1675. Yeah, so right around 1966 case production, we see the introduction of the matte dial and it has the very small triangle for the 24-hour hand, which was a carryover from the gilt watches that preceded it. And then you have what you typically see, the much larger triangle. And this one is a Mark I with a long E on the dial. And just to show a little variation that's very collectible, this is also a Mark I long E, but the bezel insert is called a fuchsia insert, sometimes called the Pink Panther, and these are highly collectible today. And this is a Mark II, a uh, little bit different style of coronet and uh, text. And then you go to Mark III, pretty easy to distinguish because it's called the radial dial. The plots are again smaller, a little farther from the track, very similar to the 6542 dials. And this one has an interesting all red GMT hand because it's so distinguishable and neat to see many of these hands have been painted red as well and are not born that way, uh, but we're done after market. Then we see a Mark V. And then uh, sort of a controversial watch, uh, the Blueberry, which there are many myths around as well and uh, strong opinions about. And you see around this time the all black bezel as well. Mm -hmm. And then we'll pause briefly to talk about some gold references from 1675 that carry into the 16700 series. Yes, so the 1675s in steel all had crown guards. You see this evolution from pointed crown guards to rounded, but the early 1675s in gold did not have crown guards. So it was similar to the 6542 before they did add the crown guards. These are both interesting variations that we call today Concord references. After the Concord plane, mm -hmm. there's a famous Rolex ad showing the pilot of the Concord wearing one of these. They're similar hands to a Datejust or a Daytona, but to see it on a GMT is very odd. And then we have this two-tone reference, which was made famous by Clint an Eastwood. actor. Yeah, yeah. Clint Eastwood. so people nicknamed this the Clint Eastwood. And don't you go believe in every rumor someone tells you. This is also called the Root Beer watch. Mm -hmm. This is a 1675-3. Later, it became the 16753. The root beer has continued to this day in terms of Rolex production and nicknames. Uh, and then we have a 16758. This was, had sapphire crystal and quickset date. The earlier ones were like this with uh, what's called the nipple dial, and later ones had larger hour plots. And as we come toward the end of the GMT Master, we have a couple of more watches here in steel. Yeah, this is the 16750, a very popular watch today, partially because of the quick set punching. The very earliest ones were matte dial, the later ones had the white gold surrounds, and the same evolution that the Rolex of Mariner saw. This one has a, an interesting dial that's called the spider dial. The lacquer has cracked throughout uh, mm -hmm. some people like it and some people do not like it, <laughs> but it's uh, part it's of like the fun of collecting. Life, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then you have the very last reference of GMT Master, the 16700, which uh, interestingly enough was made concurrent with GMT Master 2 references. And so here we have a pretty important division from GMT Master to GMT Master 2. Can we talk a little bit about what makes the GMT Master 2 new and different? The biggest thing is the independent 24-hour hand. With these, you could only adjust the bezel and the hand would always 
reflect the time, but in 24-hour format, you can now adjust that to any other hour. And it's, and it's an important division, but it's also important to note that over the course of the production of these watches, the GMT Master continued well into the production of the GMT Master II. Yeah, and I don't exactly know why that is. <laughs> Maybe it was a cost. Uh, it was less expensive to buy that than that, but uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> it is interesting, yeah. And, and so we have the very first GMT Master II here with the first Coke bezel that, yeah. we, that we'll see. And this has a kind of an interesting name, the Fat Lady. Yes. It's yes. also called the Sophia Loren. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The watch is a little bit thicker as a result of the caliber that they developed to have an independent 24-hour hand. And then more famous for the sort of five-digit references is the 16710. We have the red and blue Pepsi variation, mm -hmm. and we have the red and black Coke variation. Mm -hmm. There's also an all-black uh, bezel also option. An all -black, yeah. And then we take another important step into watches in the GMT Master II range with Cerachron bezels. These are watches that we would see very much as modern watches today. Do you want to maybe start with these steel models? Yeah, so when Rolex first came out with this watch, it had the Oyster bracelet with the polished center links. The case on these is very much beefed up, not in terms of diameter so much as the size of the lugs. They had the all black bezel with a green 24 hour hand and then the famous Batman as it's called, the black and blue bezel. It was rumored they did that because they were having trouble producing the right color of red. So for a number of years, the Pepsi was discontinued until we saw the original white gold GMT, the very first GMT made in white gold with a Pepsi bezel. And again, it, it was rumored that the Pepsi debuted in gold as a way to kind of limit production because producing that red was difficult. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's the only other time I know of where Rolex has sort of offered a conversion of a watch. And that was when they introduced the Pepsi in steel. They offered owners of the Pepsi in white gold the opportunity to switch it to a dark blue dial. So this is the black dial and they now make this only with a dark blue dial shortly after they came out with the uh, watch in Everose, which is a new root beer in terms of the two-tone bezel. Going back to the Pepsi and Steel, uh, as sort of a way to differentiate it and presumably not make owners of the white gold version unhappy, which it still did anyways, <laughs> they made it with a Jubilee bracelet hearkening back uh, to the 1970s when some were sold on Jubilee bracelets. And then we had another steel version of the GMT Master II with the yeah. blue and black bezel uh, coming on a Jubilee. Exactly. Establishing a rule. Exactly. We'll say that steel uh, GMT Master IIs now come on Jubilees and gold ones come on uh, Oyster. oysters, yes. You know, when this was introduced, this had been discontinued just prior to it, so it's a big debate among modern collectors whether you prefer the Batman on the Jubilee or the Oyster. Strong feelings on both sides. Teach his own, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so from the very first reference, the 6542, right up into uh, some modern watches from a year or two ago, what does it mean to have all of these watches here in front of us on this table? You know, a few years ago, the only way you could get a Pepsi was to get a vintage watch. So if you like that look, it wasn't offered in the current production. It's really wonderful to see all the micro variations that are important to collectors. It's no small feat to see something like an OCC dial, two versions of the double Swiss. As there is more knowledge and scholarship around the watches themselves, they become easier and more interesting to collect. There are a lot of GMT watches on the market today, but I really don't know if this is a design that has ever been beat. Sometimes the original is the best. <laughs> well put. Yeah.